I was going to go to the bathroom, but I realized the mic was still on. <laughs> Would have been, been inappropriate. <laughs> Not the first time that I've recorded myself doing that. Um, so what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> There's always that part of the conference, right, where people are like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And that's me now. <laughs> we reached that. Yeah, this is me influencing my kids running, and I realize I, I, I won't tell them that they have to walk home if they don't win the race, because I'm guessing that's not going to influence uh, fatigue. And I got to stop telling myself I'm worthless as I run a 5K then, so I need more positive self-talk. Uh, yeah, all my kids run. We make them run. Nine, six, and three. She, this, it's actually not windy. That's me yelling at her that she's not trying hard enough. <laughs> the psychologist, too. All right, so we're talking about running retraining. And we'll start with this uh, assumption. Pain is weird. So are my kids. Uh, so sometimes we, we see odd things, even though we think we know what we know. Uh, we, and we think we, we know why we know it. It's, uh, it's not always easily explained. And movement can be weird. So that same kid can have like a dysfunctional movement pattern. There's no symmetry here. You know, the poor little goddamn thing can't even go straight. That's why we keep her in that cage. You know, we wanted to keep her separated from her older sisters in case that movement behavior was, uh, you know, contagious. Like, look, I'm like, come on, come straight. Boom, just starts veering off. Like, can't even get out of the cage. We're like, stay in your cage until you can do this properly. So, so we know we can move weird and not, have, and not have pain. I mean, she is messed up still. She's, my wife's like a lactivist. You know what a lactivist is? It means like you extended breastfeeding. So all my kids have breastfed for a long time. And she's three now. My wife wants to wean, but she just sent me a text where my wife said to Mimi, you know, Mimi, I love you. And she said, Mommy, I love your boobies. <laughs> so... So it's time, it's time to wean. I don't know what I'm talking about. All right. So, can, I like these questions. You know, can our treatment be explained by uh, other means? And then sometimes you look at treatments, you say, what are the, the common factors in that therapy? And I try to do that with running retraining. Meaning we can look, all of us can look at the same type of information and see something different. You know, so who sees blue and black? Anybody? Who sees uh, gold and white? Yeah, you're all, you're all wrong. It's the text that we're reading. So, uh, yeah, so we see the same information, you know, but you can come to different conclusions. And it's so interesting that Brian spoke this morning, because I didn't know Brian was here, and I was writing a lot about his research, you know, and then uh, and his stuff, we can... Uh, look at the same information and sometimes come to a different clinical conclusion. And we'll do that with gait retraining. You know, because we can say with treatment that for sure... Uh, uh Okay, there we go. For sure, we can do something. You know, whatever you do with your patient, you increase your cadence, you put your hands on them, you talk to them, you explain pain. And then we have this black box and then something happens. You know, we're not sure what's going on in here. This is what's so challenging to be a clinician. You know, we know that tendinopathy can hurt. We don't really know why sometimes. We know that exercise can help for tendinopathy. But we don't even really know why. It's quite interesting. So we have this black box, and that's okay. Um, you know, and so with, when it comes to gait retraining, it can definitely help. You know, it's something where we're not sure why, we have ideas of what's I, but we can do something to how they run and they can have less pain and hopefully more running. You know, so it's certainly sufficient. You know, and we know with different gait retraining things that we can do, we can change cadence. You know, Brian's work is excellent in showing what can happen there. You can do proximal changes where some people think, oh, I'm gonna change how, my, how stable my hip is and how much my knee caves in. You can think of changing your foot strike. You can give some sort of cue like, I just want you to land softer and you figure it out. You know, and all of these can change some biomechanical measures. We can get kinetic changes, we can get kinematic changes. We can get kinematic changes. So we can have kinetic changes. These are great graphs uh, by Daniel Lieberman, you know, showing uh, how foot strike and shoes can change how the foot hits the ground. You know, we can have uh, people run softer. This would be Crowell's studies and uh, Irene Davis, where they're just said, land softer. And uh, that will end up changing this vertical inst instantaneous loading rate. Sometimes this impact peak is decreased, so definitely changes can occur. 
you know, and this is uh, Brian's studies earlier. If you go up the chain, you can make these changes and you can have less load at the patellofemoral joint. Uh, you can have different loads at the, at the hip. You know, different uh, foot strikes can also change load. So often a, a four foot strike, you know, you will see a, a decrease in load at the level of the knee versus a, a heel strike. Cadence, of course, is such a strong mitigator of load as well. You know, and then, so we see these biomechanical variables, and then we wanna say, can we change pain? Because that's what patients come to us. And certainly, you know, we can make these changes to someone's technique, and over uh, two weeks or eight weeks, they can have less pain. So that's awesome, because that's what patients wanna hear. Yes, here we'll see people change gait again, uh, just giving feedback. Uh, I think Brian did, uh, I can't remember their intervention. I think, not sure it was in a mirror, but doesn't matter. We can change biomechanics and then pain can change is the point. Okay, this is a famous quote. You might have recalled it. It happened about five hours ago by Dr. Brian Heidershed, where changes in symptoms can help determine the running change intervention. It's totally paraphrased, but let's make it famous now. So put it out on Twitter. But what's interesting here is that the thing that is important is symptom modification, right? That's what mckenzie has been saying for years. That's what Mulligan's been saying. So you find something that hurts, and then we do something different to make it not hurt. And so this is the part where it's a bit of uh, conjecture and skepticism. And this is where I'm going to argue that maybe some of our interventions when it comes to changing biomechanics, that it's not the biomechanic that's important, right? That you don't necessarily have to change the load. You don't necessarily have to change the technique that you can somehow adapt and you change something to do with the output of pain. Because pain is more than just nociception. And that's what's so exciting about the research to me. So, you know, how are, so I ask questions like, how do we get big changes in pain when we just have small changes in load, right? Because with Brian's work and others' works, you would see changes in knee load at 10%, sometimes 17%. You know, it's not too much. You know, do we know if you just have a 10% decrease in load, are you dramatically changing nociception enough to not have pain? And do you even have to have those changes to have pain relief? You know, if I do this, and it hurts, gait retraining is this, it's changing it. But could I do this and just slowly learn to tolerate this over time? You know, that's the adaptability and tolerance idea. Do I always have to change this to this new running technique? Or can I go back to this after we desensitize? I was gonna have you guys do that, but we won't. You know, so I wonder if we get too excited about load and we get fooled, that's like a surrogate measure. We measure load. Uh, you know, because we think it's more important than pain, but pain is really what people come to us. So we get, we get really excited about these surrogates and, and maybe we shouldn't, you know, and to me, another thing that we want to think about is adaptability, right? We can have, can we have osteoarthritis and have no pain? Totally. Can you have a femoral acetabular impingement and have no pain? Absolutely. You know, we can have weakness and not have pain. You can have crazy, weird looking running kinematics and not have pain. That's, she's supposed to come out there now. So if we see Priska Jeptu here, a very elite female marathon runner and half marathon runner, it's a very famous video. And we wonder, how can someone run like that? Most people say, oh, right? She's like my wonky daughter, just a little bit faster. <laughs> right? So how does she do that? She's tolerated this, right? She has tolerated, it's a, akin to someone tolerating an osteoarthritis. It's akin to someone tolerating a femoral acetabular impingement. You know, so if there's no ideal way to run, it means that maybe ideal kinematics don't exist. So maybe there's something else to our gait interventions besides teaching people to run the right way. And what's, 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 exciting, thing, what's exciting to me is this sort of question here, is that do we fix or do, or do we facilitate this adaptation or tolerance? Are we really changing someone to the best way to exist, or are we doing something to allow them to tolerate it? When someone has knee OA or hip OA, are you really changing that hip or knee OA? No, 
you're doing something to change the sensitivity and to, and to have tolerance to that. Femoral acetabular impingement, same idea. We see it in other realms with psychology. If you have depression, you know, and it's related to pain, you don't always have to get rid of the depression. That would be terrible to say that people have to get rid of their depression to get out of pain, because it's not true. You end up tolerating these other stressors in their life. So often, you know, we do a lot less about fixing, and maybe we do some sort of a facilitating this adaptation or building tolerance. So what's this? This is tolerance, and this is adaptability. Any second now, which is akin to this. You can tell this is American. I'm not American. I wouldn't vote for Trump. <laughs> oh, there's no sound. Okay, so he's like uh, an MMA fighter. He kicks people for a living. I mean, he's not as tough as me. This guy, he's like a karate dude. Yeah, yeah, and he gets, he gets what they saw. Severe testicular injury. There we go. Can Kirby withstand oh. the pain? Or will the kick turn his avocados into guacamole? I'm just, just going to sit here. Two, one, go. <laughs> okay, that's good. We... <laughs> Okay, oh, look at this guy here. <laughs> That's the psychosocial aspect of pain, where you communicate something. So, what that guy says, he says he felt, felt no pain there. I had a patient once in a, car, a, um, a therapist in a course once saying, I could teach you how to tolerate that in 45 minutes. I mean, like, what about that 45 minutes? <laughs> you know, what's wrong with you? And that's adaptability. Is there nociception going on there? For sure, you know, if we go, if we all go and punch a wall, we do it for a while, this is going to hurt initially, and you'll actually increase the sensitivity in the short term, but you do it every day, then your nuts don't get turned into guacamole. You start to tolerate this, and you habituate to that nociception, you know, so that can be some of the factors with gait retraining, is that we don't have to remove the guacamole kick. We actually learn to tolerate that might be a factor. Another surrogate of things that we think we have to fix in the past and maybe we don't would be the transverse abdominus craze, you know, for the past 20 years. And most of the research coming out now says those things don't have to change. You can have delayed timing. It's not a big deal. You know, it doesn't correlate with changes in disability or changes in pain, you know. And so the idea that maybe load in and of itself isn't that bad, you know, so Runners can run 100 kilometers per week. And so if we're changing load just 10%, is that really the big factor that's changing their pain? You know, or runners can run a certain way for a decade and then they suddenly have pain. Is it really just a change in 10% or is there something else going on when you make a gait change that's more than just load? You know, because if you think about it, you know, just a 10% change is kind of small. And it's, if in terms of total load, it's like going from 60 kilometers per week to 55, you know? And if, if load is that important in this way, is a gait change enough of a thing to change load or is it doing something else that's more special? And I always get worried and I, and I, and I think most therapists are pretty good at this, but I've heard, I've had patients where they come in and they think they're ruined because they feel like their gait is wonky. You know, you, a, a therapist might come in, assess someone running, and they're like, oh, that's the worst foot strike. Your knees are horrible. You have poor hip stability. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to get all these problems in the future. So I get worried when we overcorrect gait that we set the stage to decrease self-efficacy and perhaps to increase sensitivity. You know, so there's always, there's always that other problem with sometimes doing too much fixing when we don't need to. You know, and then, so this idea of chronic adaptations that we, we know that we can adapt to loads over time. And then maybe it's not always about load because we would never say, you know, we, can, we know that in general, a forefoot strike has less load at the knee than a heel strike. But there's not a lot of research saying everyone should be forefoot striking. So it can't just be about the load. And so one possible mechanism when we look at these gait retraining studies, is the idea that perhaps it's a bit of graded activity. 
you know, you slowly increase your load over time and the person adapts. But even that doesn't always make sense because even in these two week studies, they're doubling the total load over, sorry, o- over, so eight sessions over two weeks. They go 15 minutes uh, of running with an increased, well, the, this wasn't a cadence, this was changing uh, the techniques of, of hip adduction. But they doubled the load in 30K and just slightly changed the load at the knee in terms of, say, 10% or so. So it doesn't make sense that a 10% change at the knee would allow you to tolerate a double in total load. You know, it means that there has to be something else going on in our gait retraining studies. You know, Brian mentioned a patient that I think went from 10 miles a week to 30 miles a week with that subtle increase in cadence of just 5 or 10%. That means there's something else special going on there if you can tolerate that much load. And so one of the issues, and I don't knock any researcher for this because this is very hard research to do, is that we all, in all these studies, we don't typically have a plausible sham. You might have a control group that just runs, but you're not giving them something where they can say, ah, if I change this variable, like cadence, and that's the one I most play around with, I now have control of my symptoms. And maybe you're building that self-efficacy and building that control. So often we don't have a sham in any of these studies. You know? And the, p- the patient has to feel like they have some sort of control over their pain. And so what might be some benefits of gait retraining that have nothing to do with load? One, we, we just have this graded return to running, and that pro- promotes the adaptability. That's that person learning to tolerate that kick in the avocados. You know? Or we have a change in expectation, where they expect there to be a change in symptoms because now they have control. And that there's other factors going on. This would be the expectation that pain is, is just like fatigue, that it's psychobiological. Or we have an external focus on a metronome, and that can be a symptom modifier, especially, uh, well, we'll come to that. Well, that would be like the tendon neuroplastic training. There are some studies that suggest that it's all just graded adaptation, graded motor exposure. So J.F. Escoulier is a researcher out of Quebec and now out of Vancouver, and they had three groups. One group did just a graded slow return to running over uh, eight weeks, and, and then they went on their own for a while. The other group did the graded return with advice on how to manage their loads and symptoms, and they did gait modifications. They increased cadence. The third group did this graded return to running with exercise rehab, uh, and they, they didn't show any difference. And so their argument for a while now has been uh, and it's funny be- how they're challenging their biases because they teach a course that's really big into changing gait and to, and to changing cadence, is that it, what's the most important is this slow adaptation. So you calm shit down and build shit back up. That's the fancy trademark. Meaning you take running away for a little bit, let the system settle down, and then slowly say, there's nothing to change about you. You can adapt. You can put this stress on your body. You were able to run 80 kilometers in the future. You can do it again. We're going to slowly build you back up with a graded return to running. And that's what they've been arguing. And then, same, and then we have these really neat, these studies are coming out, just the abstract now, where it, pain is weird. It doesn't always make sense. I think they had 43 subjects. And what they asked them to do in some of the, some of the times was just find a way to run with less pain. Right? And sometimes they would give more cues, like we want you to increase your cadence. That's their big one, because it has such a strong biomechanical uh, effects. But in some people, the way that they found uh, to run with less pain was to increase the load on the knee. Really interesting. It was more load. It was just something that's different. It doesn't mean it's the best way for everyone, but it's a proof of principle that perhaps load isn't everything. Or you'll, you might have a patient who doesn't follow your advice and they go do an exercise you think is wrong and they do way more than you think they can handle and they feel better. Like we're, we're confronted with these things in clinic all the time. You know, so this is a nice study to give the idea that it's not just about load. You know, and the one argument is that it's associative learning. So pain becomes coupled with other variables and that's driven by a psychological process. So load and nociception is certainly related to pain, but expectation and context as well. So if someone bends over and they have pain with that, the associative learning idea is that you associate those non-nociceptive cues, the perception that you're bending over. That perception of bending over gets associated with pain. 
So we expect it to happen. So with running, you run, and now for some reason it's painful because of whatever change in load in, in your life that sensitized you. And now you've associated running with pain. So perhaps what we need is some uncoupler where we do something different to break up that association. That's the idea. So that's when you hear people, they feel they have pain running on concrete, but they say, I can run in trails all day. And it makes no sense because they're often running up and down and you would expect more load, but they've doubled their volume. It's the change in context and maybe that it's something different and that's the associative learning idea, which now is, was first proposed to me by Max Zisman and now it's uh, uh, the people writing on that, sorry, there's, there's no reference here, is Mosley and, and Vallejo are talking a lot about this. So in other words, maybe we just make some change to a variable and that might be part of a good general rehab and it's driven by symptom modification. So our gait intervention is whatever keeps them running with less pain. So rather than being fully driven by biomechanics, you think it's symptoms that are most important. You know, and so another one would be external focus. So there's a lot of work with Jill Cook's group and Ebony Rio, where they have people do uh, isometric contractions and isotonic contractions where they're paced to a metronome, right? And for some reason, this is a preliminary work, having an external pacing, doing an isometric, isometric contraction or isotonic contraction helps decrease pain. Might running be the same idea, that you pace it to something different. You think about something different. It's some other change, you know? So cadence retraining or maybe even mirror retraining might involve this same mechanism of external focus. So again, what are the common themes? Is that we can recognize that the body can adapt. We can tell the patient, you've trained previously with this running technique. You know, you can tolerate it again. You know, and so maybe we just have this slow graded activity to running which recognizes our ability to adapt, tolerate and habituate. So we don't always even have to change gait. And maybe we use gait modifications as a temporary desensitizer. You know, it's okay to tape something. It's okay to be in a cast. It's okay to be in a brace for six weeks. So you do something get different with your gait to get out of that pain habit, and then you don't have to worry about it in the future. And I wonder, what, and Brian even said it with his patient, the marathoner, was she changing her cadence the whole time in that, in that marathon? It's unlikely, but it might have been enough to change her perception. It might have been enough to change what she did with that nociception. That nociception could have been the same the entire time, but it's how she processed it that changed the pain. And that gait intervention might have been the way that, that uh, she processed it differently. It really wants me to focus on this slide, but I'm done with it. Okay, so again, you know, some questions. Can we treat gait interventions like a temporary cast? It's just something different to, to change the sensitivity. Or maybe this model, this idea that I'm presenting is limited. Maybe there are certain injuries where things actually need a fix. It's not just about facilitating an adaptation. Maybe with stress fractures where load and biomechanics might be more important, you know, that we might be exceeding that load. Maybe it's more important there. And so that's why I have to question what the limits of adaptability are. But those are big questions. Great. Thank you.